60 year degree learning without boundaries. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the senior director of programs, sponsorship and membership here at WCEP. And I'm thrilled to join a number of wonderful colleagues today for this webinar discussion. If you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box. We are recording this and we'll send the link out later. And if there's any resources that are shared, we'll also be compiling those and sending those out. Kim will put the link to these slides in the, the chat if you want to follow along. But it is mostly a discussion today. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. That hashtag is WCT webcast if you wish to follow along. We'd like to thank our partner Bibliu for helping us pull this together, as well as our caption provider, Bytac. So captions are available. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A and we'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A. We'll try and hold questions until the end of the discussion. But if there's a question we need to jump in and handle, we certainly will do that. Try not to enter your questions into the chat because sometimes there's such a lively discussion we lose the questions in the chat. So today's moderator is a good friend of WCET, Dale Johnson. He's the Director of Digital Innovations at Arizona State University and he's also on the WCET Executive Council. So I'll let you go ahead and take it away, Dale. Thanks so much. Thanks, Megan. So welcome, everybody. I'm excited to moderate today. We have three great experts joining us. And while they're introducing themselves, we would like to know a little bit more about you. So we're going to put up a poll to give us a sense of who's participating today. Uh, we'll look forward to sharing those results. In the meantime, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself and tell the, the audience a little bit about your background. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Weiss. I am a senior advisor at Imaginable Futures as well as Bright Hive. Um, I just came out with a book called Long Life Learning, Preparing for Jobs That Don't Even Exist Yet. I am the former chief innovation officer at Strata Education Network in Southern New Hampshire University. Nice to be here. Thank you. Dave, would you go ahead? Hey, yeah, great to be here. So I'm Dave uh, Sherwood. I'm the Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Bibliu. We are a content learning management platform that make um, finding your textbooks and courseware more accessible and help you automate your workflows. Um, I set this up whilst at university to address the problem I was experiencing myself as a student. So um, great to be here. Wonderful. And Paul? Uh, Paul Marka, Principal of Parallax Global Advisors, an advisory firm focused on uh, the future of uh, education and uh, the future of learning. Um, previously, uh, 32 years at Stanford University, uh, the last 10 at, as uh, Associate Vice Provost for a unit called the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, responsible for delivering education uh, from university to really industry. So uh, bring a practitioner's perspective uh, to the conversation. That's great. We've got three innovators on the panel and we've got quite a diverse group. I, you should be seeing the poll results now. We've got a number of administrators, some academic officers and faculty, which is great. I think that as you see from the panelists, we have a wide perspective on this topic. So we're excited to dig in and, and share some of those insights with you and then field your questions. As Megan mentioned, please put questions in the Q&A and if they come up during the conversation, we'll try to introduce them and we'll try and leave some time at the end as well. So at this point, I wanted to, oh yeah, there we go. I wanna talk a little bit about today's objectives. So we hope to inspire you and to have you inspire your colleagues about a 60 year learning journey. We think that's the new normal. Uh, we hope to offer some insights based upon our experience and then we want to help you imagine some opportunities to share the ideal that if we build something that is sustainable and is scalable, that the, uh, the communities of learners will find it as they have with other venues like MOOCs, and we'll, we'll begin to see this as a lifelong learning journey as well. Uh, we'd also like to know a little bit about how your institution is addressing the lifelong learning market. So here's a second poll, if you don't mind, while I start talking a little bit about the topics, you can fill that out. What we're hoping to do is to start off with a metaphor. We think a little bit about lifelong learning as a climate change. So 
we are in a new climate in terms of market, in terms of institutional readiness, in terms of demand from the professionals and uh, students. So as part of that hypothesis, higher ed has to adapt or die. Climate change is real, how do we adapt? And what we wanted to do is to dig in a little bit about three big questions. Why is it critical for higher education and learners to think about a 60 year lifelong learning span now? How could we support the learners through that process? And what opportunities are there for innovation in this current uh, uh, climate? So I'll start off by asking Michelle uh, her thoughts on why this is critical for our higher ed and learners now to think about this lifelong learning journey. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's really this concept of lifelong learning as the new post-secondary education. And I think we've all intuitively understood how critical lifelong learning is to our future. But I think when you just sort of flip it around and think of the longer life that we can anticipate, because our lifespans are extending, our work lives are extending, people are staying in the labor market for far longer than they had ever anticipated, it's becoming harder for us to um, feel okay or secure in a future that is going to be constantly shif shifting because of all these rapid technological advancements. We're not necessarily feeling like we can depend on that two or four year degree or that high school diploma to sustain us for that longer trajectory. And so as we think about, you know, you know, sustaining that longer work life, it forces us to you know, recognize we don't actually have the mechanisms, the infrastructure, the systems, the architecture to actually facilitate those kinds of seamless movements in and out of learning and work. And I think maybe we've sort of um, assumed somehow, you know, extension schools might take care of it or MOOCs or boot camps or, or these other things, not us, but these other things will take care of it, right? And I think the real, um, the real opportunity that, that lies ahead for us is to figure out how do we actually pivot to this moment and actually really reimagine and reinvent our structures so that we can truly meet learners where they are instead of, instead of just talking about that. Paul, you spent most of your professional career building the infrastructure for that. Maybe you could comment a little bit on Michelle's thoughts on how do we develop that new culture? Yeah, I think, you know, Michelle's absolutely right. If you start thinking about the lifespan, uh, it's critical that uh, universities and, and other structures uh, develop the, the sort of capacity to address that great opportunity to get re-educated maybe every five years might be the requirement. Uh, and I think as universities struggle with what I call the business model of education, right? Seeking ways to, to uh, buffet the, the sort of financial challenges. Um, one way is to start expanding the market, to start to look at alumni and adjacencies uh, so that programs can be extended and expanded to those people. Um, at, at SCPD, the Stanford Center for Professional Development, the unit that I ran, um, we provided uh, a lot of education, first uh, a graduate program to, to help those very highly qualified, a professional and executive education to address a much larger market, and then custom programs around the globe. And, and our focus has been to try to provide uh, education that will make a difference uh, now, sort of just in time and just for me, uh, but also to sort of target um, the, the evolving workforce. So conversations with industry was really, really vital. Um, and then increasingly we've been going overseas to, to work with industry and governments to think about ways to, to make, make adjustments there. So I'll, I'll stop there, Dale, lots more to talk, but I'll stop so there. That, that's perfect to think about this as an opportunity you know, we, we often have found ourselves constrained by that 18 to 24 demographic. There is an entire population of, I read this morning, 30 million people who took some college education but never finished. So there are new markets to tap. And Dave, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you view this market and how the services are uh, developing in this space. Yeah, sure. And I'll talk a bit from the perspective of an employer as well, because we employ um, 70 people now. And uh, it's a it's an interesting area from that angle, too. But yeah, in, in terms of the, how the services are developing in, 
in the space. I mean, uh, uh, Michelle touched on a lot of the, the software that's out there already in terms of um, MOOCs, um, uh, various learning platforms that sort of look to kind of fill this area. I think Lambda School is a really cool one um, where uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it, where the fees are essentially only paid on success. So you have to obtain a certain job at the end. And if you do, then you pay essentially a tithe for a couple of years. But if you don't, then, then you don't have to pay. Um, so I think things like that are really trying to tie themselves to the workforce. Um, in terms of what, what we do at Bibli, we work with a couple of um, lifelong learning institutions. So um, the three main ones we work with are ICAW, they're an accounting institute. They, they, they certify accountants, but they also help them with their lifelong learning. We work with BPP, the University of Law, and they're a bit more focused on, on law, but also do a bit of accounting too. And, and, and not just the qualification, but a lot of the lifelong. And we support them by providing the, the, the content that they need to, to, to um, run these programs, um, textbooks, courseware, and help them manage that. Um, yeah, and then from the employer's perspective, I think it's all about alignment with, with, with the employer. I mean, we, we all, almost always have a significant gap between where someone's hired and their experience and ability and, and what the job is. Um, and, and we essentially hire engineers, sales, marketing, finance. And the skill set, I think, is very similar to pretty well every other software company out there. And it'd be wonderful if institutions could be, you know, um, providing people job ready for these um, these roles. And, and whether I know, I know some institutions enforce um, essentially like a, 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 a do some work whilst you're studying. So they spend a Friday of every week throughout their, their degree, whether it's two year or four year in, in the workplace. Things like that could be really interesting. Obviously tying the curriculum in, bringing employers in to actually provide training. Um, all sorts of options, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting topic, Dale. And I think as, as Michelle kind of alluded to, I don't think there's a clear solution to the problem. I'm glad you mentioned accounting because in my experience are some professional organizations that require continuous professional development. That would be accountants, uh, medical professionals, um, educators, and those are the, the organizational associations that have really been the bedrock for this lifelong learning process. Uh, I have friends who are doctors and they have to get recertified every 10 years. So if we look at those as, as aspirational opportunities, I think there are other places like technology where the technology changes so fast. If you learn to code in the 90s, you're probably on your third language now. So you have to continually upgrade your skills. And the, the question for me is, how do we do that now? Where's the supply side? So we know the demand is there. And how do we find the resources in our organizations to build a supply side? Uh, I don't know, Dave, do you want to pick up that conversation where you, and we're in the middle? Yeah, of it? so at one point, I do really feel quite strongly about the placement internship piece that, that, that a students can undertake whilst um, doing their course, uh, essentially as part of their course. So there are a couple of universities we work with every student of theirs has to do an internship whilst doing their course. Um, paid internship too, so it's, um, it's a plus for the, the student. And what that means at the end of the course, many of the students get offers straight away from the company, but more importantly, Dale, as, as you've said, I think really the only way to get real live up-to-date um, training is in, in the workforce. And if you, if you couple that with the theory and the teaching from the university or college, you've got the perfect mix. And I think, that sort of compulsory internship placement thing is a really nice way to do it. It also means we have a bit more of a direct relationship with the university and college in question too. So, so, so when they have graduates coming through, they you know, can send CVs across and stuff like that. I think it's quite I'm important. Glad you brought up the idea of being paid while you learn because what we found is there's this balance, this life work balance that gets distorted when you try to edit education. So professionals who are working full time, trying to keep the family uh, together, and then you add education and everything sort of falls apart. So we've worked with Starbucks at Arizona State for probably five years now uh, to help build a lifelong learning path for their uh, associates. And I know when you were at SNU, Michelle, you were doing some innovative things there. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how do we help the supply side, our colleagues at other institutions, create the capacity 
to, uh, to balance this three-way load now? Yeah, I think uh, an important thing that you were alluding to is this notion of time poverty, which is that as well-intentioned as we all may be to skill up and get, you know, acquire new skills and, and, and market ourselves better for the workforce, uh, that requires time. And if you look at all these $100 million skills building initiatives out there from you know, Amazon to JP Morgan Chase, they're all really exciting, but they still haven't solved for how are they going to actually carve out time for people while they're earning a living, right? Like while they're earning, how do they learn? And we just, it's, it's this just fundamental constraint that we have not solved for. And even within institutions, as we consider the fact that probably one in five students is actually a parent, uh, has parenting responsibilities. We are not sort of thinking about how to make our learning pathways more flexible and convenient. Um, one of the interviewees that I um, chatted with in my book actually talks about how she would load all of her classes over a 10 hour period on a Saturday because that was the only time she could actually go to college and she was that was the only and she she was a new mother she was pumping all day walking back to her house to deliver bottles to her baby going back those kinds of things are not sustainable for the future as we think about you know how do we do both at the same time how do we integrate earning and learning and what Dave is talking about is really being uh, deliberate about work-based learning opportunities. And that can come in, in, in a myriad of fashions. It doesn't just have to come on the supply side. It can also be in real deep partnership with um, the employers as well. The employers can really take an onus in developing more and varied kinds of intern uh, apprenticeships that are not so trade associated, but for the new skills of the future. So, and you see this kind of emerging in, in, in all different kinds of programs where, um, there are these kind of boot camp models, but very much geared toward our, you know, the our most vulnerable populations who maybe only have a high school degree. Many of them are formally incarcerated, but there are these on ramp programs through Job Train, JVS, IC Stars, Launch Code, all these really innovative groups that are building human and technical skills for their learners in cybersecurity and manufacturing and healthcare and data science. And they're giving them enough skills and then doing these interesting kinds of try before you buy apprenticeship models where the employer gets to try them out before making that decision to hire them. And it really facilitates this process where you know, hiring managers are often risk averse. They don't want to take the risk of hiring someone without a degree. But through some of these models, you actually get to prove out that you can you can actually do the job that that is required. So it's going to be um, you're just going to see more uh, learning providers, training providers, employers sort of putting more skin in the game, right? They're just gonna, they're gonna actually uh, take more, more of the onus upon themselves to make that more direct connection between students or learners and employers. I'm glad you, you raised the issue of the learning and training because I happened to look up the fact that the learning and development market is a $160 billion market last year. So in higher ed, often we think, well, we have our market and, and we're over here and we have to tap the high school seniors or the uh, you know recent uh, graduates to get them back into grad school. But learning and development has already been working in this space for probably 50 or 60 years to, to create the opportunities for learning. And I found, I was working with Singapore. They have the Institute for Adult Learning, which is their version of a lifelong learning uh, government support agency. They give every citizen a stipend every year to use for educational services. So they're building it into their culture. And, and I think we have to look outside the United States for some inspiration. Paul, I see the Great Wall of China behind you. So maybe you could comment a little bit about what other innovations have you seen or elsewhere that the colleagues on this webinar would find helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think Michelle makes a, a great point. How can you start to think a little bit about uh, the evolving scenario and, and, and structures and approaches that, that might pilot a, a, a future state? Um, I think our center, the Stanford Center for Professional Development, the, the center that I directed, was an important part of the School of Engineering, but really divorced from the sort of main uh, apparatus. And I, and I think part of the opportunity is to connect universities 
um, to really start to um, use design thinking and empathy to understand what customers are, are, are and, and customers I use in the broadest sense. Um, a couple of examples, um, we had a, a conversations with, with five to six uh, companies in Thailand. Um, and they were really interested in upskilling their people around sort of innovation so that you could have um, employees bringing insights uh, from their customers into the organization in a more effective way and then leveraging and creating new products and services. Um, that, so we built a program there to, pr to provide that. Um, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, they're moving from oil and gas to very specifically um, focused on small to medium-sized enterprises as a future state. And so we built a program to help that, to enable that to happen. And, and I think universities, um, so we, we do that off to the side. How might we bring that conversation and lesson back to the, to the university organization? I think that's the, the potentially the, the, the missing link and the, the, I think a great opportunity. So there's a great question that Calvin Bentley just submitted right on point. Let me read his question here, it came in through the Q&A. What incentives can we provide to colleges and universities to adopt competency-based education curricula to help provide adult learners with more flexible learning experiences? So I know each of you have a good experience with that. You know, maybe Michelle, you wanna take a first uh, cut on, on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think one, one possible incentive is around new funding models. I think if you look at the traditional kinds of partnership models that we have tried to develop over time to try to make those connections more direct between educational institutions and employers, we've, we've always been kind of just innovating within the sort of the circumference of um, tuition reimbursement or tuition assistance programs. And those are really kind of limited in terms of, you know, that $5,250 cap. And Dale, the, the budgets that you were pointing to on the training and development or the learning development side are far just, they're vaster than those tuition, re the, those tuition assistance funds. Those are typically HR benefits. Those are not, those are separate from those kinds of TND and LD dollars. And so there's real opportunity to, sort of figure out how we allocate those resources better because uh, not only that sort of $100 billion market, $100 billion market that you pointed to, Dale, but we spend, employers spend approximately $200 billion a year on talent middlemen because we can't get these connections right. We can't translate the skills of learners to the, to the jobs that are in demand. And so if we think about that bucket of dollars that we are not leveraging well, I think there's really, um, when you kind of remove yourself from the constraints and the regulations uh, of Title IV dollars, which is how we've tended to innovate, um, you can actually start to imagine different kinds of more flexible partnerships that aren't based on time, that are in fact based on competencies. And you can leverage AI powered platforms that surface skills and skills gaps for an employee or, an, or a job seeker and helps you understand exactly how you match that person to better fitting learning opportunities, right? Because even if we identify someone's skills gaps for a really promising role in the future, when you try to actually map that gap filling learning pathway for a learner, you're often trying to wedge like a two year program or a one year certificate. There's never really that kind of precise targeted educational pathway that you can point a learner to and say, here, you need to develop these four competencies in order to move forward. We don't have that kind of structure. And so I think once we kind of extricate ourselves from our traditional channels of Title IV funding, of degree-based um, learning opportunities, we can get a whole lot more creative about the solutions. So just so everybody knows, Title IV is the federal financial aid, and that's been our, our little tiny piece of the pie. What we're really saying is there's a very, very big pie out there that you can avail yourself of if you have the infrastructure. And Dave, you got, you got to start it on this conversation. So as a, an employer, what's your perspective on how do we get the skills assessment done and how do we help build those skill maps? Yeah, um, really good question. I think um, from an employer's perspective, often we don't, we don't put enough time into doing this ourselves. And it's really, you know, we should be trying to work with the individual employees to be like, okay, here's the skills you have, here's the skills you need. 
here's a plan, you know, let's work with this university, this college and this MOOC. Um, so we really often don't put the time in, but I think often in reverse, um, if an employee comes to us with a training plan they'd like to do, um, we'd often improve it, right? Um, so I, I guess, Employees should be more organized, but may, maybe maybe the colleges and universities can help the employers offer to do a free skills map and then tell them which courses would plug the gaps, right? I think that would be quite cool. And also um, empower the individual employees to, um, to, to create their own skills map. And again, that's something both employees and the universities and colleges could do. Yeah, and I found Singapore has another group called Skills for Singapore, which is doing that mapping. They're trying to get ahead of that demand curve to say, we've got these employees, we, we need to help them figure out what the next step in their career is. So I look to that for some guidance. And the other one I found is LinkedIn is suddenly becoming a go-to resource for these kinds of career maps. If you want to talk about lifelong learning, LinkedIn is building, uh, along with their Linda uh, acquisition in the Microsoft family, this kind of infrastructure. So if higher ed doesn't start doing this, there are other competitors in the market that are moving quickly into the space. And Paul, you, you were in that competitive space for decades. What, what's your sense of where the future is? Yeah, so, so part, part of my service now is advising many of what I will call the sort of uh, uh, companies that are sort of looming on the edge, trying to make a real impact and, and seeing the enormous opportunity that frankly universities are not sort of harvesting and, and, and leveraging. I'd, I'd say a couple of things. First, um, the companies are, are in a position now, those organizations, large and small, that are interested in trying to hire the best and brightest talent. They're seeking ways to deliver uh, on the promise of education. And uh, now education, to some extent, is becoming a commodity. That is to say, Coursera and edX have a whole lot of content that, that I can avail myself. I think from an incentive perspective, um, those consumers, uh, those learners, need to think, are seeking credentials. And, and I'm probably going to make a, a, a trade based on cost and, and credentialing. And I think I'm imploring universities to consider, you know, what experiments can we drive? How can we get into the conversation with a local company or organization, wherever you're based? How can we start to learn um, their needs and interests? Uh, because I, I think we need to def expand the notion of, of a, a student. Um, and it's, it's the, there are, I'll reference Stanford. Uh, Stanford has a, a website, um, stanford2025.com. And we did four scenario-based design thinking uh, approach plans. And, and one of the best uh, scenarios was uh, sort of how can you design on-ramps and off-ramps um, as we expand the notion of student with universities. And, and, and you know, universities um, often say we don't do that or we'll pilot uh, or we'll experiment. And I noted in our panel uh, uh, survey as we, as we opened the session, 20% of the participants are fully integrated in the university uh, context, these, these extended ed units, but 80% are not. And, and as you say, there's, there's an enormous opportunity. And if we, we you know, higher ed doesn't solve this to address the 60 year degree, corporations will run off and do their own thing. They'll invent their own structures. They have, as, as Michelle rightly pointed out, significant wherewithal to make this happen. And increasingly, uh, the, the notion of getting educated will uh, determine whether I'm viable in the five to 10 year increments that, that, we, that I see, at least, that, that people are telling me about as, as I have conversations with companies and organizations. So we have another question from Nori Barajas that is on point as well uh, around this question of how do we do this? Her question's a little long, so give me a second here to read it to you. Short form learning is all the rage right now, but it will only be additive to working adults if institutions will acknowledge, acknowledge prior learning for those who eventually seek degree completion. What is this panel's projection for greater transferability of certificates, certifications, or industry competencies evidenced in some way? So is there, are we, are we missing a critical component of this 60 year degree in that we don't have a way to uh, store and manage and measure the learning this way? Michelle, you wanna, you wanna take a first stab at that? Yeah, just the concept of transferable skills is a, just a 
a deeply like it's just a hairy problem within post-secondary in the workforce. Um, it is actually why we saw s- such an incredible number of people who were just stuck once COVID hit is we don't have mechanisms to actually say, hey, even though you've spent 10 years in retail, here's how you transfer and port over those skills into an entirely different domain. And in this pandemic, it was just a, it was just a highly unusual circumstance where people could not figure out a way to move forward within that existing industry, right? Retail, hospitality, transportation, all, you know, food services, these places were just completely decimated. So that, you know, those people who were just newly laid off had nowhere to go within the, the wheelhouse that they were familiar with, right? And so we saw how nearly impossible it was for people to move from one totally different domain or seemingly different domain to another. And I think that is, uh, you know, as, as we think about um, greater transferability, I mean, I think there are, there is real hope in some of the sort of plumbing and dirty work going on right now with Uh, someone was mentioning the open skills network, a lot of this effort to get clear on a lot of these competencies and naming these skills, because depending on what context we're talking about, critical thinking means something very specific in advertising, PR, and marketing. And it means something very different in behavioral health or something very different in financial planning, right? And it's, so we have to get very granular about these skills so we can start to enable some of that transferability and, and transparency. But I agree, it's, it's a really, I mean, it was just so stunning to see the economy come to a halt because we are unable to move vast numbers of people from one place to another, from one you know stuck place to a better economic opportunity. Yeah, that's a painfully poignant insight. I'm glad you said that because when you look at the impact of COVID on different sectors of the workforce, the professional technical sectors had almost no impact, but the services sector has been devastated. So if you're not interacting with service personnel on a regular basis, you, you really don't know what's going on out there. There's a lot of pain and suffering. And without these kinds of mechanisms to assist people in that transformation, there's, there's no lifeline for them. So th- this, and really this webinar is very uh, timely too, because we're really talking about building that lifeline. We're really trying to figure out how do you extend the ladder of success to the people who never had that first rung to climb onto. Dave, you look like you wanted to jump in. So you, you have a comment? No, I, I didn't actually have a comment, but I'm, okay. I'm yeah, enjoying the conversation. <laughs> no, and Paul, any thoughts on how do we help get started? I mean, I, I think, so, so again, I think credentials. So right now, um, the lazy money from corporations is going to universities, branded universities, and so on. Um, I, I think as, as uh, uh, folks now start to think about the consumerism and, and con- content and, and knowledge is, well, content is ubiquitous, uh, a quick search will prove that uh, design thinking happens at Stanford and MIT and at a bunch of other diff- different places. And suddenly you're, you're starting to compete for, for the, the interest uh, and the eyeballs, right? And, and I think th- this is important because as you consider how um, the, the sort of Amazon notion the, the sort of compare and contrast, um, it, it creates opportunities uh, for companies and, and it creates opportunities for organizations and universities to address that, that sort of market that, that's expanding. I think that's one thing. The, the second is um, the, the reason that the, the money's going to sort of branded universities right now is because it because it's easy, and it 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 it, it eliminates any conversation. I, I think there is an opportunity though uh, to compete in that space, um, and and so if you can get a product uh, or think about your particular area of expertise and build something that's unique and different, and drive a credential that the university honors, uh, then then you you're, you're sort of you're going to be in good shape. I, I do think that Stanford experimented with a, sort of a my locker. Uh, scenario where I would have my my credit, my non-credit content, my presentations, and I'd be able to share that on a blockchain basis. So that, as Michelle said, there's some, there's some evolving things happening in that space that could be very, very interesting and enabled by really the sort of, I'll call it the digitization, the digital revolution that, that higher ed is experiencing right now. So there's a question, a follow-up from Nori about the 
it, this kind of infrastructure, uh, she, she asks, what do you believe might be a potential accelerator for greater transferability of short form learning? Is it accrediting bodies, institutional industry partnerships, or is there something new that we have to invent to facilitate this? Because we have friction in the market right now. It's, it's painfully obvious that there are inhibitors in terms of time and money and resources and supply of educational services. So how do we start to uh, facilitate that and to make this marketplace work more efficiently? I think that's actually tied to Laura's question below um, on you know, how, how, how would a Biden uh, yep. administration maybe hurt or help these kinds of short form learning opportunities. For me, at least, the answer is kind of related uh, in the sense that all along, you know, really over the last few decades, we have seen a clamoring on the part of a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, alternative learning providers who are not in a regionally accredited space, um, who are who are asking to be evaluated on their outcomes, right? So some of them are also for profit entities. And that word has become so stigmatized over time that they want to prove that they are actually, that their learning experiences are leading to great outcomes. And so I think as we try to think about um, all our reservations about short form learning opportunities, it has to always be tied to outcomes. And I'm, and I'm hoping that with a Biden administration that it's not just gonna be this sort of black and white for-profit, nonprofit tax status decision-making process because it's, it's not useful and it's not um, nuanced enough. And what we have to get clear on are what are the performance outcomes we need to see from these pathways? Clearly earnings outcomes matter. Clearly the ability to pay off a debt load matter. Clearly also non-economic benefits matter as well, right? Like, are these, feel, are these people feeling fulfilled by these opportunities? Do they feel like they have found some sense of purpose? Do they feel valued? Do they, do they see employers validating their skills in the labor market? So it's, it's that space that I think we have a lot of work to do because if we do it right, right? If we think about those outcome standards properly, then it's not gonna matter so much whether someone, you know, someone's tax status says that they're a for-profit or a nonprofit provider. Um, but it's really about, are these learners actually making it into just much better places that they couldn't have dreamed of before? Yeah, I feel like we've taken a run at this problem over the last 30 years, several times. Western Governors University was a product of the same conversation. Like, well, how do we, start to facilitate this process in a new way. And then of course the privates, whether it's the University of Phoenix or uh, Grand Canyon University or SNU or others, um, th they all fill the need, right? These are, these are market needs. So the question, I'm from a public university, so I'm always wondering how come we're not meeting that need? And now we are trying to, and we're working on initiatives to do that, but I'd be interested in Dave or, or Paul, other thoughts about the opportunities now, we're in the final stretch of this webinar. What, what are things that our colleagues can do to engage the learners, to engage the employers and to, to create these new services? I mean, I, I would uh, jump in. I'm, I'm advising one of the firms that's uh, providing boot camp uh, opportunities, and, and they're working closely with universities in partnership to evaluate the content, as Michelle said, to, to consider outcomes and thinking about the marketing and recruiting and development of that content, as well as the, uh, the, the job placement uh, function, which is really important. And it goes to some Dave's notion of an internship and then tracking and providing that. I think um, that, that scenario is, is a really good one. And, and what I would implore universities is start thinking about how you partner with folks, with organizations. And, and, I, I, ha and I know that this is really difficult in universities. Um, when I was at Stanford, I had a weekly meeting with the Office of General Counsel to ensure that we could have conversations about potential contracts and opportunities and, and think carefully uh, respectful of the brand and all the legalese and so on. Um, but but my, my goal was to drive outcomes and, and to get to, to have the opportunity to partner with a BibliU, to partner with um, a number of uh, open class 
classrooms in France where we, Stanford, had very little presence to work with great learning in India to explore what, what opportunities we might deliver in concert with oversight from faculty and in, in sort of recognition that it is, it is difficult, I would implore universities to think about ways uh, to partner and experiment and do so uh, with an eye toward evaluating those results and thinking about how that insight and content even can be benefit the residential students. Yeah, and to, to add to that, Paul, I think that's exactly right. I just agree, agree entirely with what you've said. Um, I think many institutions find it hard to partner with external providers of any sort, whether they be if, you know, a, a startup for profit like ourselves or maybe a charity not-for-profit um, partner. And I think if an institution is very interested in going into exploring lifelong learning, or it could be something else, it could be any sort of initiative, it could be online. I think it's very important that, as Paul says, they look to, rather than reinventing the wheel, bring on the partners that can help them help them achieve these things. And I think actually the key is to actually set up a process. And Paul was talking about t talking to the general counsel. Most institutions don't have a clear process for adding new partners to, to, to the scheme or identifying partners that, that tie in well with their strategy. So uh, I would recommend, I think the institutions we've worked with that are most effective at this have some sort of committee um, with a set budget each year for new projects, not just a renewal budget. And um, a anyone within the institution can pitch technology partnerships to the committee. Uh, the committee review them and, and, and select some and, and, and approve them in, in a monthly meeting or something like this. So there's a constant um, flow through of new partners coming through. And also, importantly, a tie to the, the president and the strategy of, of the organization. I think, as Paul said, in terms of brand, of course, in terms of brand, but also in terms of strategy. So I think institutions um, yeah, need to make it a bit easier for themselves. So, and the alternative is you get more and more, you know, fully private organizations that are doing their own thing, I guess, like a, a Lambda school, which I guess are inherently competitive. So, so a partnership is a way to take this market rather than letting it be fully private with with fully private competitors. So um, I think partnerships are key. The other piece I would add to that is a business model. If you're trying to do something and you don't even know what you're trying to do, as Michelle was indicating, you, you have to measure something here. Is it going to be growth in student enrollment? Is it going to be successful execution of more credentials? Is, what, what's the social impact? Is it going to benefit your local economy, your region? Then you can seek partners. I'll give you a quick summary of Arizona State University Online, which is now about 65,000 students. A decade ago, it was about 600. And we had failed twice because we didn't have a good business model. Finally, the leadership team developed a business model that was scalable and sustainable, and they needed a partner to get off the ground. So Pearson became an OPM for ASU Online for five years. And I consider it sort of like training wheels, where the organization learned how to do this through partnership that then were un, unneeded or unnecessary any longer. So after five years, both parties went their separate ways and we have a successfully scalable and sustainable business. So as you think about your process, think about what are your objectives? What is your business model? What are the partners that you need to get this started? Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I welcome more questions and uh, the panelists can continue to weigh in, but I, I would encourage you, we've already had three really good questions, so feel free to drop some more into the Q&A slot. And Paul, you look like you were going to jump in there on that question of business model too, since you ran a business over there at Stanford. Yeah, and I, I think, Dale, you've got it exactly right. Sort of what is the, and then Dave mentioned this as well, what, what is the strategy? How can you align with the organization? What's really interesting um, is, is a potential opportunity uh, slash conflict. It, it turns out that if you're SCPD and you're off to the side of the university, you can actually develop some interesting, especially uh, for, for our professional programs as well as our custom programs, you can, you can develop some interesting pilots and tests and bring that back to the organization. Whereas if you're central, uh, you might be, uh, if you're a central part of the organization as 20% of our, our folks are, uh, it's, it's actually a little difficult to, to sort of run that. But I love Dave's notion of a, of a process 
What we were focused on is trying to, to evolve uh, impact in, in various regions around the globe, and including in, in China and other places. And, and in, in doing so, we had to, to think strategically about each potential opportunity, market opportunity. And as you say, if we were losing money, um, we were laying off people. So it was a, really a function of generating enough revenue to ensure that, that we would be successful. Um, and, and I love the notion, I did a keynote talk in Thailand and I said to folks, if you're not running a, a, an experiment with edX or Coursera, you're not trying hard enough just to learn the, the, what, what technologies they're using, how you might observe uh, student interaction and input and start to become more intelligent to your point, Dale, about, uh, about that, this uh, sort of edge, extended ed as a potential market opportunity for universities. And Michelle, you're in the Innovation Center, so you know how to, how to think about these things. So how do you think strategically about this kind of innovation? Yeah, I, I like what Paul is um, sort of underscoring there, which is this kind of strategic learning agenda. And what Paul's showing, right, is that in certain cases, you cannot fail within the sort of confines of the existing traditional institution. And that's why you see so many different groups, ASU included, kind of building um, more autonomous units, separate business functions that can start to question and experiment and innovate and also fail and learn very quickly what is working and what is not. And so I actually... Um, worked very closely with Clayton Christensen, who is the godfather of the theories of disruptive innovation. And, you know, I think when people uh, get paralyzed, they start to feel like, well, I don't know if I can truly come up with something disruptive, you know, and, and disrupt higher education. And in fact, most people can, like even within, even within the context of nimble, private businesses, it is inordinately difficult to deal with disruption and it's okay. And it's important to recognize that there are some things that are just going to be impossible to do from within. Um, I think it's important though, to start pushing the boundaries of what is possible within, right? And, and as we think about the opportunity available, be partly spurred, well, mostly spurred by the pandemic, which is to have to shift to online education. I think the real missed opportunity would be to leverage this moment and simply try to translate what we've been doing in the classroom into an online, into this kind of Zoom environment. This is not innovative, right? <laughs> like, the, you know, teaching a class on Zoom is not the way of the future. Um, what we have to think about as we think about the, the work of the future is we need people who can think nimbly, who can be very adaptive, who can show resilience, who can exercise judgment in highly ambiguous circumstances. We need to be building a new kind of curricula around problem-based or inquiry-based models, right? And we cannot do that just simply just transposing or translating what we're doing over here into this kind of video environment. That is not the opportunity ahead. Um, and especially as we think about this lifelong learning market, sometimes the skills that people are going to need to acquire are very much just pure technical skills. Sometimes we're just going to need to have some understanding of artificial intelligence enough to be dangerous for that new job. But a lot of the time it's going to be around those human skills that we need to develop and hone and practice. And how are we going to actually build those skills in this kind of environment? That is the real kind of exciting opportunity. And, and how do we also think of that in a short burst um, sort of constraint? Because some of this kind of deep learning takes a serious amount of time to, to kind of cultivate, right? If we want to be great problem solvers, that kind of learning is slow and deep and doesn't show up well on tests. So how are we going to design around that for someone who is 55, 65 and still seeking a new transition? So I think that is um, that to me is exciting. And that is well within the confines of what we do today within an institution. So you just gave us the theme for our next webinar, because I think you're right. That's the new frontier of learning is how do we and, and we, we use this phrase flippantly, but learn how to learn. How do we build that intellectual capacity to continually develop new skills and to seek out new opportunities? 
But I wanted to go back to something you said earlier, which was this idea, you didn't use the term, but I could, I could hear it in my, in my inner ear, skunk works, where you set up an organizational group and, and Paul, you might've felt that way a little bit around the engineering college that has more liberty so that you can experiment and you can innovate without adversely affecting the core. Uh, but at some point, we need to become part of the core. And as Paul highlighted, only 20% of you feel like you are already part of the core. So as a final thought here, we've got a, a, about six minutes left. How do we help people go from being an auxiliary service to being part of that core academic conversation? What types of structural changes, uh, leadership changes, philosophical changes might a university need to make in order to feel like the, the lifelong learning conversation is part of the academic core? Dave, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, um, good question. So, um, I think, and I think some of the things we touched on today about lifelong learning and um, um, making the most of the academic core, I think, um, uh, from, from from our perspective as a company on the outside, I, I think institutions. And I kind of touched on this before, so I might I might be repeating the same. In institutions, you know are increasingly at risk of um, d deprecating some of the things they do. And I think, to, so to refer to what M Michelle said, just creating a video is, is not necessarily going to cut it. And we talked about content being a commodity as well. And I, th I think that's right. I think increasingly content becomes a commodity. What what universities do that's completely unique is, of, of course, give a, a, a branded you know qualification. But I think more importantly than that, they provide personalized, structured teaching environment and importantly keep, keep, keep the students accountable for finishing the big problem with all of the free content on the internet is i don't i don't know anybody that's put themselves through a course end to end on, on the internet without any supervision without any tutoring without any deadlines without any structure uh, there are people out there but i know the numbers are not great so i think that's really where the institutions come in super handy and and there's nothing better than having an expert tutor to, to make your life a bit easier when you get stuck. So I think marketing to the strengths is key, both in terms of lifelong learning, but just in general, as things move a bit more online. And the strength is the people, the faculty, um, not not the, the, the video that they create or, or the lecture that they run, but them and their, their ability to um, keep the students on track. So I, I think that's really important. Yeah, we have to convince the faculty that this pie getting bigger is beneficial to them, not just more work but more recognition, yeah. recognition, whatever it is, yeah. yeah. Well, how did you convince faculty at Stanford to participate in your programs and, and lead these educational initiatives? I, I mean, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of coffee and lots of lunches. Uh, and so <laughs> my waistline is benefiting given my re retirement from Stanford. Um, I, you know, look, I, I, a couple of things that I, that I would say, you know, my, my, my big fear, uh, if I could be slightly negative, I'm an optimist, uh, is that in fact, this COVID opportunity has pointed um, a red hot spotlight on the online education space and universities, uh, almost every single one has done an amazing job at, at uh, moving at the speed of a couple of weeks to, to launch programs and to sort of just good enough kind of uh, education experiences to provide for students in this very awkward time. I think the opportunity is to try to experiment and improve what we have done and look at you know, new technologies. Um, you know, Zoom is not it, but class for Zoom might be. Uh, Engagely, uh, Daphne Kohler, Stanford faculty member at a a good friend has created uh, a, a new product that might be interesting. I think there are lots of things that uh, that would afford some experimentation. And my big fear is that um, many universities craving uh, attention and, and ability to sort of interact with people in the hallway will it'll, it'll, it'll just rub band back to where we were, as my good friend Nelson Baker at uh, Georgia Tech would say. And, and I think it's incumbent that universities uh, carve out space to develop experiments and pilots um, to improve the opportunities, but also to address this emerging market and expand opportunities for the residential students. You know, what if we could put an entire junior year online? 
and afford place-based uh, action-based learning in Thailand where students can take their curriculum at night and work in Thailand during the day helping uh, just causes, uh, think Peace Corps, but for education. So there are lots of things that I would love to, to encourage people to think about um, in, 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 during, during this time and, and to still require a coffee and convincing. Yeah, and, and we have examples of innovations like that at Northeastern University and, and elsewhere. So these are not impossible dreams. I think what, what we really want to see is leadership among the participants in this webinar take the next step. So Michelle, why don't you finish us off with comments on how do you, how do you go from being a, a disruptor to being a leader to being a champion in, uh, in this space? Yeah, I think um, even just the question, right, that we've been talking about is how do we convince faculty to do X, Y, or Z, right? And if it is, and, and just trying to tie in with what Dave was just talking about uh, in terms of the value of the university to kind of help with accountability, help learners persist, it is a very striking mindset shift to move from the faculty being sort of the central sort of locus of control to truly being learner centered. And like one university I saw that did this well is uh, Tec de Monterrey um, in Mexico. They're like the MIT of, of Mexico. Their strategy for 2020, this was back five years ago, um, was that the, the faculty of the future were gonna be split into four different roles and none of them it really revolved around being a lecturer. And one phrase they used was that they were gonna be a docent, that they were gonna be that real guide on the side to kind of help the learner persist in their learning journey. And I think that's critical here is that there is great value in human touch points. This is something that online learning providers have learned very early on is how much they have to invest in advising and coaching and accountability. And not always does that mean that that's the faculty. That is sometimes a very different person, but it is that really valuable human touch point. Sometimes it's even taken care of through these chatbots that are emerging too. So it's not always like face to face, but we do have to think about how we uh, truly kind of put our focus into action. And really when we say we're learner centered, that means sort of deferring our needs as faculty members or administrators to do things that maybe make us feel uncomfortable. And that's why you see this happening in these kinds of autonomous units or these Skunk Works programs is because the people who, who, who are the first adopters or the first movers in those spaces have already bought into this new mental model. Sometimes you have to just sort of start all over from scratch, like the Olin College of Engineering, where they said, no academic departments, we're just not gonna have any departmental silos or the London Interdisciplinary School, which is a new school where instead of having 45 faculty members who are experts in 45 different disciplines, they have 10 faculty members who are going to cover 45 different academic disciplines to, to demonstrate that kind of range building and that generalist sensibility of being able to kind of you know, take problem solving capabilities and use it for, you know, bigger questions like how do you measure unhappiness or how do you measure curiosity? So these are the kinds of things um, that, that, are, that are really, um, they're, they're really exciting and it gives me hope because you see these kind of seeds of innovation out there. We just really need to see more widespread systematic kind of moves in that direction. That's great. So let me, summarized briefly here to give you four thoughts that I take away from this, and hopefully you've got your own list. One is student-centric approach. We have to start thinking about this from the learner's perspective, not just the faculty. Second, there's a bigger market out there than you ever imagined. So start seeking out new markets for your services. Third, eliminate structural impediments. And Jolanta placed a question that we didn't get to into the Q&A, but it was about impediments between transferring from community college to a four-year institution or using your credits for a lifelong learning experience and then getting college credit later on. These are the structural impediments that we need to break down. So you have to break them down locally and then we have to do it nationally as well. And then finally, experiment, experiment, experiment. And at Arizona State, we stole the phrase a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. And we use that to inspire people to try something. I want you to 
this afternoon, jot down an idea of how you might use some of these opportunities to expand your educational portfolio. So we thank you for your attention today. And Megan, do you need to wrap up in any way? Yes, I just want to say a quick thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists. This was a great discussion. I wish we had much, much more time for this conversation. And again, you can reach out to any of our panelists there. Join us on future webcasts. Uh, we have one coming up on February 18th that is going to be very exciting with Michael Horn and Michelle Levine and our good friend Shante Rakasner, who's on our steering committee, will be moderating that webcast. So this webcast is also free and open to everybody, so you can register via our website. And I just want to take a quick moment to recognize our supporting members and our partners that underwrite much of our program and events here at WCET. So thank you. Go out and innovate and stay well, everybody. Take care. Thank you all. That was fun. Thank you, everybody. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah great job. Thanks, guys. Oh, great work. Enjoyed it. That was a good conversation.